during our initial due diligence and eligibility requirements, what I'm trying to make sure is first that the borrower meets all of the USDA regulations. And that I'm also able to create a deal structure that meets the client's needs, right? And to do that, a big part of the due diligence consists in gathering documentation from this client, this borrower. And of course, the documentation needs to be up to date and needs to be relevant for the loan transaction that we're trying to do. So for me, it's really difficult to overstate uh, how beneficial it is for the borrower, the company, uh, to run an organized due diligence process. Similarly, on the other hand, I, it, I have to stress that it could be harmful or it can delay things if the company's diligence disclosure is really you know, disorganized or a little sloppy or it's full of gaps. So think about it. When we receive data or a data room that is organized, it likely conveys, oh, okay, this borrower looks like this company uh, is well managed, right? And you know, issues will arise, things will be have to be addressed. Sometimes really the project doesn't feed our credit box. But you know, from the perspective of a well-run process, we'll give the, the borrower the initial benefit of the doubt. On the other hand, however, if the data room is a mess or the information that we're looking at in different documents doesn't really match. It's likely that me and my team, um, not that we will suspect the company is fully run, right? But um, they're likely going to trigger a lot more questions. There's going to be even deeper inquiry and we're asked for more documents. So the process that is already lengthy itself can start to drag out and take longer than it really needs to take. So I think one of the biggest problems that generally I would say small or medium-sum businesses run into is trying to you know, stay the course, do their day job, so running the business, while trying to go through a lending process like the USDA. And this is completely understandable. It can be a lot to overtake. So I think this is where like a broker or an, an advisor can add a lot, a lot of value by helping the client throughout the, the whole process. So if you ask me one, uh, what is one of the most important documents that brokers uh, should work on with their clients, a document that, you know, it's one of the best ways to make a good first impression. This is having a good business plan. And, you know, when I think about the business plan, the CIM, confidential information memorandum, the book, whatever you call it, it is really the document that tells me the story of the business. It's a mix of, you know, disclosure, risk, uh, market business. It is about how great this company is and what are the, you know, what are the future prospects? It's also what happened in the past and why is this company, what are the reasons this company is looking for a lender like NIC? Everybody remembers uh, stories, the stories stick. So make sure that you or your client uses the business plan to tell their business story. You know, it's great to get on the phone and hear from the business owner firsthand. Uh, but let me tell you, it's even better to have it written down in the business plan uh, because I kind of always go back and uh, look at the business plan. And to be honest with you, I always find myself retelling the story later on, either internally to my investment committee so I can, you know, get internal approval and issue a client or term sheet or externally to the USDA uh, when my team and I were trying to get, you know, the USDA approval. So a few things to keep in mind um, that must be included in the business plan. So first of all, like we're talking business summary, uh, that story we should mention, make sure that is included. Another important item is the legal entity structure with ownership percentages. So this could be very simple if you just have one LLC and maybe two partners, you know, it would be three bubbles, <laughs> the name of your LLC, the name of your partner, and how much each uh, of them own. But it can get a lot more complex. You can have an LPGP structure, you can have a pairing company with multiple subsidiaries, you can have a Holco and Opco. So it's really, um, I mean, we don't really dictate how you set up 
uh, your legal structure. We're really flexible and open to whatever uh, you prefer to do, but we don't really need to know that from the get-go. So kind of make sure that when we're structuring your deal, we are, you know, uh, asking the right questions and looking at the right documents. Another important section, project location and description, going back to the definition of rural, where the project is located. So make sure that your address is included in there um, so we can double check that. Of course, sources and uses and equity sources need to be in there. So this is literally a breakdown of all of your project cost, what you need the money for, and how are you covered for, for those costs? Is it, what's your dollar amount that you're asking for the loan? How much equity are you gonna bring? Is this equity already raised or you're in the middle of a capital raising? Um, all that needs to be included. Of course, moving on, the next section I'll say, it included discussion of the management team. This not only includes uh, owners and personal guarantors, make sure that key employees that are important to day-to-day -day operations are also included. And last but not least, financial statements. This is a big ticket item. Uh, some borrowers include a financial statement summary at the end, and then they have uh, an entire model they provide separately. So you can do that as well. I know some financial models sometimes are pretty robust. 